I have a purpose. There is a meaning to his life. And it took me a while to figure that out with Martin's character. And so that's really what I was trying to get at and trying to understand that, you know, with these characters, if you watch both movies, it's like understanding my life. And I have so many of those moments in my life where time after time I realized I discovered more and more about what God has planned for me. I was like, you know, every time I thought, oh, maybe God wanted me to do that. And then like, you know, reflecting on it a year later, I'm like, oh, wow, God really had a different plan for me. I didn't even realize it was like that. Paul Quo is one of the supporting lead actors for the God's Not Dead and God's Not Dead 2 movie, now showing at Malco Cordova, Malco State Cinema, Malco Town Cinema, and the DeSoto Town Cinema. Now, Paul Quo has also co-starred in the hit series Scrubs Season 7 finale, as well as co-starred in the remake of Knight Rider. Paul also adds singer and musician to his resume, releasing his first solo vocal album, If We Live for a Million Years. Paul has performed on piano with cellist Yo-Yo Ma. That's pretty big. International pop singer Wee Wee and a whole lot more. We want to welcome now Paul Quo to Mid-South Viewpoint right here on Bot Radio Network. Paul, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me here. Glad to have you here. You play Martin Yip in the film God's Not Dead. Of course, God's Not Dead 2 just coming out. How did you first read for this role? Uh, well, I you know, I went in there uh, in the beginning when I uh, auditioned for it, went into uh, Billy the Motor Cast thing, and somehow I just ended up getting the role. Somebody told you about it? You heard about yeah. open auditions? No, it was just my agent. My agent sent me on an audition. It was just like any other audition. And I wasn't any, there were, I had no special connection <laughs> to get me in. <laughs> you didn't slip him a 20, I guess. No, no, no 20s. There. <laughs> it just happened. I got really lucky, you know, to get into this movie. Paul, there's sort of three streams to your career, actor, singer, musician, and entrepreneur. What motivates you most to be so diverse? I just love it. And that's all it is. I mean, I'm, I'm very blessed to be able to do all of this stuff. And I think, you know, a lot of it is my parents, you know, being, being actually very supportive of what I do, because not every parent is supportive of doing these kind of careers. And I think some of it is actually, you know, my parents, because my parents, uh, my dad is a pastor. And so he, they sent me to piano lessons and, and violin lessons when I was a kid, mainly because so I could serve at the church. Like, here, learn the piano so you can play at church. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of how I got started. Is there one of these areas that you enjoy more than the other? Well, I mean, I love it all. I can't, re you know, <laughs> it's like choosing which which baby is my favorite baby. And I'm like, I can't really say I love it all. Yeah. Um, I mean, I enjoy acting a lot. I love to sing and play. And I love the business that I run. It's like my other baby. So it's like, I can't really pick any of this. Don't make me choose. Yeah. <laughs> well, is it tough trying to find balance sometimes? Oh, um, you know, it, it can be. It can be. And um, there are times in my life where I have to focus on one over another. Like when I first started my business, I kind of like threw away my my acting and my 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 music for a little while. They do come back, but that's the thing is I feel like you know a lot of this is just divine guidance that happened. To, you know, was like booking even the, this movie because it happened when I booked this movie. It was right in the beginning of me starting my business and. I couldn't even imagine having to leave, but then everything just happened so quickly. And I was like, what happened? You yeah, mentioned so. starting your business. What exactly is your business all about? I actually have a performing arts school in the Los Angeles area. I started that in 2011 and 2012. So in the first two months of opening my school, I ended up booking this movie and had to leave for three weeks. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I left my assistant there for three weeks by herself. And she's like, oh, my gosh. And it was her first job ever. She's never had any other jobs in her life. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I have to run this. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, you were born in Hong Kong, but you grew up in the suburbs of L.A. Now, for our Mid-South listeners, L.A. is not lower Alabama. It's Los Angeles. How often do you travel back to Hong Kong? And what's your favorite place to eat when you're back home? Oh, I mean, I go back to Hong Kong like every four years or so. I think I'm actually due to go back this year or something like that. Um, 
in terms of restaurants over there, I don't even know. I just kind of rely on my relatives over there and ask, what's your favorite restaurant this year now? Yeah. And send me there, and that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> but I have a lot of favorite restaurants in the Los Angeles area. Like, you know, there's so many good food here. I believe it was your high school teacher who gave you your big break in acting, was it not? Yeah, yeah. My high school... It's funny because I I I was never really meant to be an actor. All my friends were like, "Oh, you can't act. Don't go into acting." But it was actually the, uh, the fact that I really didn't like my friend's teacher, <laughs> <laughs> and so I wanted to get out of French class and acting. My other friend have have to say, "Oh, here, join acting. You should come and join acting. It worked perfectly within my schedule." I was like, "Okay." If I go and do acting instead of French, I could also get out of my English teacher class and go to a different English teacher, which I didn't enjoy either, my original English teacher. So that's kind of how I got into my acting career, because I didn't like my French and English teacher at that time (laughs) and wanted to switch. When I was in high school, I was really thankful there was a high school recording class, one of the first in the nation in our high school. And I, I was ready to quit school until that program came up, you know, and it just changed my whole world. What encouragement do you give students participating in their school's drama department? Oh, I think, you know, for students who are in the high school drama department, enjoy that time. I really love my high school um, uh, drama time, uh, the time that I spent it, because it's one of those rare opportunities where you really get to live with that group, same group of people all year long. And once you get out of high school, even though you're in college and stuff, you don't necessarily live with the same production. You have lots of different teachers when you're in a college theater program. You have a lot of different people and a lot of different shows and groups you're working with. But in high school, it's kind of like you get a little family that you kind of go with for a couple of years, and that's rare, and you don't get that opportunity all that often. You know, treasure that moment. Treasure those times. I'm still very, very close to my high school drama teacher. In fact, I went to her, her daughter's birthday party two weeks ago, so I'm, like, I'm really close to them. They're like family to me. Now, is your school, the drama school you just opened up, is it for all ages? Tell me about the setup of the school itself. Um, yeah, it's for all ages. We have kids as young as three years old because we teach music, piano uh, lessons and voice lessons and instrumental lessons as well as dance classes and, and acting classes. We even have a little Disney musical class where they sing and dance and act. And we start them at like three years old and we go all the way up to like, I think we have our oldest student is an adult that's about to retire. I think he's like a high school teacher and he's almost retiring. So, you know, we welcome everyone because to me, it's more about sharing the love of the art, the performing arts. And it's not, you know, some students want to become uh, professionals there. And then we have some really talented students and some students just want to learn, wants to get better at an instrument because it's a dream that they've had all their life uh, to play an instrument or to learn how to sing better or how to use the voice better, or earn some acting. And, you know, it's fun. It's great. And I love that environment. To me, that's what performing is about, you know, creating a fun, wonderful little environment for everyone to enjoy. You know, I kind of feel Hollywood-based. Uh, we have a lot of focus on on-camera acting and things like that. We, I call it Pop Rock Academy. So <laughs> that's kind of a little bit more contemporary, a little bit more today. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. Paul, you know, God's Not Dead 2 offers an extension to the basic theme of God's Not Dead first film. How do you feel both movies complement one another as it relates to Christians not shying away from taking a stand, even when it's contradictory to the mainstream viewpoint? You know, I think that's what uh, God's Not Dead, both of them, is really about taking a stand and standing up for your belief and not shying away from saying it and making that that declaration and you know, if somebody comes in here and tries to clamp you on your belief and saying, no, you can't say this, you can't tell people your belief, your faith, you can't share this, and that, that's when you want, or, or, you know, try to force you to make a declaration against your own belief. And I think that's the, the bigger picture that a lot of people might miss, is that both characters are being challenged to go against what they believe. It's not even about not being able to say something, but that they actually have to say the opposite of what they believe. Because in the first one, we have Shane, the character, you know, the teacher forcing him to say, God is dead, and that isn't his belief. And then the second one, where the teacher is trying, being forced to apologize 
for making a statement about Jesus as a historical figure and apologizing for something that she doesn't believe she did anything wrong. And so I think that's what it's really ultimately about. Like, we shouldn't have to go against what we really believe and be able to just make that statement and say it. And so I think both movies at heart is about that. It's about us as Christians being able to just speak up our own mind. Can you relate to any level of persecution in your own life as it relates to standing for a specific conviction you have? I've been actually very a lot more fortunate <laughs> than a lot of the characters in this movie because I you know, have a lot more supporting people. I've had some incidents in colleges, some college professors that tend to be a lot more negative towards Christianity. And so I can definitely kind of relate to some of those incidents. I didn't have a professor actually making me write the declaration that got it said, but I have some classes where, you know, it got a little bit icy if you were too Christian-y in those classes and with those professors. So I can relate to them, uh, to the first lead character in the first one. But then one of my friends in high school, her parents were completely against Christianity, and she converted it to, uh, to become a Christian while she was in high school. And that was a big issue for life at that time. And so I related to that, and that's just like the character that I play, Martin Yeep, because his father is completely against becoming a Christian in that first movie. And you would find out even more about that drama in the second movie, and that is totally connected to, like, you know, related to my own life and the friends that I have and what they've experienced. And I've seen a lot of these kind of stories, especially with a lot of uh, Asian immigrants coming here in the U.S. And some of the second generation or first and second generation, when they become a Christian and if their parents are not Christian, a lot of times they're very anti that concept. I don't want to give away too much of the movie because we want people to go see God's Not Dead too. but there is a scene where you actually get to lead someone to Jesus Christ. As you prepared for that particular moment in that scene, I mean, can you kind of take us into that experience for you, what it was like for you, and how does that actually part of your daily life or your daily opportunities as you meet people? So that scene, it was actually very different. Like, you know, I view that scene not about just about like you know for me in conversion of another person in is with martin in that moment it's not about converting book it's really about himself finding his meaning in his life because you know that was his first time ever converting anyone and it's about discovering god's plan and understanding wow god has a plan for me and god does have something that he wants me to do and that i have a purpose there is a meaning to his life and it took me a while to figure that out with Martin's character. And so that's really what I was trying to get at and trying to understand that, you know, with these characters, if you watch both movies, it's like understanding my life. And I have so many of those moments in my life where time after time I realized I discover more and more about what God has planned for me. I was like, you know, every time I thought, oh, maybe God wanted me to do that. And then like, you know, reflecting on it a year later, I'm like, oh, wow, God really had a different plan for me. I didn't even realize it was like that. Yeah. This is what he really wanted. Yeah. And so those are, that's the moment that I, like, I really connect to that moment uh, from that perspective. As you've traveled the country promoting God's Not Dead and doing interviews like we're doing now and also God's Not Dead 2 movie, has anyone shared specific ways that they've related to the storylines of these movies that gave them courage to hold on to their faith? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of people you know, who've expressed to me um, in some in brief, some in length, you know, about how this movie has changed them, how inspired them, and affected their lives. Um, I get a lot of that from my a lot of Twitter followers, and especially when the first movie came out, I got so many Twitter followers that came up to me and told me about like their life and what happened and all these testimonies and all these stories about they brought someone there in, in from a friend of theirs or family member to the movie and and they became a Christian as a result of watching the movie and or they now have the courage to kind of voice their opinion and uh, because they're a college student or they're a high school uh, student and they had similar types of experience with some of their teachers and it was just wonderful hearing all these stories and that this movie has actually given them a, a strength in their faith. And I, you know, I'm very blessed to be able to be a part of this project. That's got to be a good feeling, too. No, absolutely. 
yeah, it, it just makes you realize how there's so much more out there and how you can actually, you know, uh, you know, your work can actually affect people if you do the right thing. And people are watching. <laughs> yeah, that's a good word, Paul. Hey, do you think movies like God's Not Dead 2 will help society have a more accepting view of the Christian voice or Bible-based values? Yeah, I mean, it's tricky. One of the things that my high school teacher, my high school drama teacher, she is so brilliant. She says, 20% of the world will hate you no matter what you do. And you can't focus on those people, but focus on the other 80% who will love you no matter what you do. And so I think we will affect the people that need to be affected. And there will be those people out there who will always hate Christianity and hate us. And there's really not a whole lot we can do except, you know, pray for them. But let's focus on the ones that are going to, you know, that could be affected, that are on that borderline, that are ready to accept Christ, ready to, you know, hear the message, ready to accept the message of love of Christ and the love that we share and focus on those people and affect those people and help them understand our Christian values, you know, of love and, and acceptance and of Christ. And I think that's what this movie touches on and is affecting, and that's what I'm seeing out there. Yeah. Paul, if there's one thing you want moviegoers to take away from after seeing God's Not Dead 2, what would that be? I think for me, it's all about allowing ourselves to ask the hard questions. Uh, for me, it's that character, my character, Martin. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you know, he has lots and lots of questions. He just doesn't stop. <laughs> and I love that fact, the fact that, you know, he has so many wonderful questions. They're all intelligent questions. And I think sometimes as Christians, we get scared from asking the hard questions because we think, oh, if I ask these questions, I'm being a bad Christian. I'm, you know, I shouldn't be testing God like that. But it's not a test of God. It's really about an understanding of God because... You know, God is God. He has the answer. He created the world. He created the universe. He has the answer. So go and ask. Go and seek that knowledge. And that way we can become stronger in our faith. We can show the world that we are reasonable people. We are yeah. intelligent people. And we're intelligent Christians. And I think that's the most important thing that we can do and get out of this movie. Well, you've worked on many of movie and TV sets. Was there anything different about the dynamic of working on this particular project? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the best part of working on this project is the people. And I love working with everyone. I can't even remember anyone that's actually mean or nasty or had a bad attitude on set ever during both the film shooting. So, I mean, everyone was just so nice and everyone was just so kind. And I, I just can't ask for a better filmmaking experience if there's anything. Like when I first got onto the set before the first movie, even before the trailer was even released, because I had no idea how big this would be. I was like, well, even if this doesn't do well at all, you know, I still had a great experience. These people were wonderful. I had a fantastic time with them. What more can I ask for? Yeah. What was your most challenging part to convey as an actor in God's Not Dead 2? I think for me, it's like, you know, there's a lot of you know, people who are a lot of things, you know, about Christian, uh, Christian films being, they're not believable, they're bad acting and full of bad acting and horrible storyline and stuff. So I really wanted to make sure I create the most believable performance I possibly could. And I remember when, when we did the first film, I sat down with a lot of the actors. I hung out with them all the time and we spoke that the things we talk about all the time. How do we make our characters even more believable? How do we make them as strong as we can and, and as credible as we can? And all the actors had a lot of discussion with the director, Harold, you know, about making our characters believable, making the story stronger. And he's very open to actors' ideas and thoughts, and that's what we loved about working with him. And I think that's what made God's Not Dead movies so much better than you know, a lot of the other movies that are out there is that we really tried our best to make our performances credible and real. You know, we took the time to do that, and and that's what I, I tried my best to do that, and I, you know, I'm, I think it kind of paid off, so. Yeah, I think it did, Paul. In 2014, you and your brother interviewed your then 98-year-old grandfather who was living during the Second World War. What did you draw out of that interview that gave you a deeper appreciation of your family heritage and your legacy? <laughs> well, you dug into a lot of my history. <laughs> um, that, that's a good one. I've never, I have never been asked that question. 
Uh, I mean, my grandparents have such amazing stories. They're still alive. They're like 100 right now, and they're, they just have their 80th wedding anniversary. Oh, my. It's crazy. It's like I can't even believe it's 80. That's longer than most people have even lived, <laughs> and they've been married for that long. Um, it's amazing what they can do if they just kept the love and kept the love of Christ in them because they've been Christian all their life. And they went through World War II. They went through the communists going into the Cambodian and Vietnam. In fact, like the whole life story is crazy because they were living in Cambodia when the communists hit them and they, they send their kids all over the world. They have like two kids that ended up in France and then some in Taiwan and Hong Kong and one left in Vietnam and eventually moved to Canada. And so my dad's side of the family is all over the world right now. Like, and it's a global family there because of that. And when that happened, when he sent his kids off to France and other places, he never thought he would see them again or he'd hear from some of them again. At one point, they were still in Cambodia when the bombs were starting to hit. And I, and I know my grandparents and a couple of their daughters had to literally walk into the jungle not knowing what's going to happen. But somehow, miraculously, all of them survived. Like two or three years ago when my cousin got married in Hong Kong, all nine kids and my both my grandparents finally have the first family oh my. In, in 30 years. Oh, my goodness, Paul. Yeah, it, it was just an amazing story. Like, their life, their life should be turned into a movie. That's all I can say. <laughs> you, you need to work on that. Start writing the script <laughs> for it. I am. I'm, I'm developing that. I'm trying to get all my aunts and uncles interviewed so I can get more details of the story. And maybe you'll see that on the screen someday. But I'll buy a ticket. The story is just amazing. Well, there is a rich legacy and heritage there, you know. I just can't imagine the the things that your grandparents have seen. It's pretty amazing. And that they walked with God through all these years. Yeah, they did. Never left God. And, I mean, my my grandmother can't read anything except for the Bible. That's the only book in the world. She's illiterate, except she can actually read the Bible. Wow. Like, that's just, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. Hey, Paul, I know our time is slipping, and we're here to talk about God's Not Dead, too, and we want people to go see the movie that's now showing right here at our Malco Theaters, Malco Cordova, Malco State Cinema, Malco Town Cinema, DeSoto Town Cinema. God's Not Dead, too. Go and see this movie. Take friends to go see this movie. Uh, I would like you to comment briefly, if you would, on the house church in China. Talk about religious liberty and be able to make a stand. And we know a lot of our liberties are being stifled here in many different ways in the United States. We see that happening in mainland China, but we still see there is a growing, growing number of people coming to faith in Christ in a church there that is growing too. Yeah, there's a lot of um, churches in China that the government, you know, try to shut down because there's, the government, there is an official church that the government allows. But then, of course, the government controls what can be preached and how, you know, they have absolute censorship right to what the pastors can preach and how they preach anything in China. I mean, it's, a, it's been a lot more open in recent years than before, for sure, in China. But there's also like a huge underground church scene where people preach without that guidance and they try to, you know, try to get away from that government control and be able to spread the gospel in a more free manner. And so, you know, there's a lot uh, at stake for those people, and that's why, you know, they try to keep it as under wraps as possible. But there are books, actually. I've actually written a play a few years ago, and I did a, a little small tour in the uh, Los Angeles area at various places, churches and stuff, on this topic about some of these testimonies and witnesses of Christians in these underground churches and how they survived through the Cultural Revolution. And those are just heart-wrenching stories, and it's just so powerful, their testimonies. And and what happens over there. And I think it, you know, we need to show the world some of these stories and get. And you can be so inspired by what these people go through because when you read their stories, it's like some of the stories from ancient Rome and how they would have to survive through government persecution and all that stuff. And that, this is just happening in 50 years ago, 25 years ago. And some of them are still happening today around the world. Paul Quo, thank you so much for taking time with Bot Radio today. Your role is Martin Yip in the movie God's Not Dead 2, now showing in our Malco theaters throughout the Memphis and Mid-South area. Please go see it. Thank you for visiting with us and taking time. We uh, hope you much success, and God bless you in your future journeys in acting, your music, and your career. Now, I just mentioned in the opening of our program, you have a, a CD. Your first solo CD is out now. Is that available? 
Uh, that's going to be available actually in about a week or so, my first single, and then the rest of the CD should be coming later in the month. So we're just in the final stages of mixing. We're just trying to get it just right so that, you know, everyone can enjoy it. But I'm so excited to get that out. And then there's also going to be a Christian single. It's a song that I sang in the movie near my God to see, but I did a Christian pop version of it. So you'll get to hear that one coming in a couple of weeks. And I'm very excited about all that. So if you want to know exactly when it's going to come out, just follow me on my Twitter or my Instagram, or just find all that information at my website, paulquo.com. Quo, by the way, is K-W-O for our listeners. And you can go there to the website, paulquo, K-W-O.com, and get all the details and see some movie highlights, too, from God's Not Dead 2. Paul, thank you so much for being our guest today on Mid-South Viewpoint. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. 